want to start off by asking the question what justice is. Justice is the, the central motif of one of the great works of philosophy, uh, Plato's Republic. There's a character in it named Thrasymachus. Anybody do philosophy here? Read the Republic? Nobody reads the Republic. It's all in Plato. Um, in, uh, Thrasymachus says that justice is the rich and the powerful getting their way. That's how he defines justice. Uh, that's the sort of thing you hear a lot these days. It's a very cynical answer. So he's saying what we call justice is simply the powerful using the legal system to their advantage. Uh, very commonly seen in uh, pop culture today. Plato's spokesman by the name of man by the name of Socrates disagrees. He says that justice is always good and it is utterly real, which is why everybody appeals to justice and why everybody complains that they've been dealt with unfairly or unjustly when their justice, their sense of, of fairness has been violated. So even children to one another will say that's unfair. And when they say that's unfair, they're not just expressing their emotions, they expect the person who's treating them unfairly to understand that they've been dealt with unjustly. So Plato's point is that justice is real and that it is to everyone's advantage always to be just. And it is always to their disadvantage to be unjust. And in fact, he says even further that uh, no one suffers more from injustice than the people who perpetrate it because they harm their own soul. Because they know what justice is, they don't do it, they're violating their own conscience and therefore their souls are being damaged in the process. Whereas the person who's being treated unjustly at least recognize that an injustice is being done. So justice is connected to goodness and beauty and truth and everything good. So justice is a good thing. Uh, for Plato, justice is also there for an individual, as well as the state, for the republic. It's a, something that every individual has. Uh, they, they're called to be just, and there is a standard of justice, and it's the same standard whether it's for the individual or the group. Now, with all that said, <clears throat> there's a difference between justice and the social justice movement. The social justice movement gets rid of the idea of justice for the individual. And it presents justice in an identity group form. So it connects justice with the rights of a particular group of, of people, not defining them as individuals at all. As I say, it overlooks the individual entirely. So my task this evening is to give a background to the social justice movement. Others will talk about other aspects of it. The social justice movement is Marxist. In, in its origin. So in 1867, uh, Karl Marx wrote a, uh, his famous work, Das Kapital, uh, which protested injustice. Uh, the injustice was specifically that uh, which was being perpetrated against the working class. So Marx was writing in the context of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, and he observed that the new technologies, the new in industries and so forth, were making the middle class and the factory owners, the aristocracy, fabulously wealthy, whereas the, uh, the working man was uh, not gaining the fruits uh, of their labor uh, equally and proportionately. And Marx said that, that not only was this unjust, it was not going to last much longer. So he prophesied that within a space of a few short years, whenever the next uh, big national war broke out, and they'd been breaking out through the 19th century, when the next national war broke out, the workers would rise up violently against the uh, factory owners, the, the wealthy, the, the rich, the aristocrats, and, and, and overthrow them and seize the means of production for themselves. So for Marx, social justice meant rectifying economic inequality. And he said that there would be a violent revolt that would, seek, would, would overturn that. Now when World War I broke out, the Marxists around the world were expecting that the working people in the factories would do exactly as Marx suggested because they've been treated with injustice, so they would now rise up, seize the opportunity, and do exactly what Marx prophesied. And they would do it in the most advanced countries because there the, the inequality was the greatest. Because the middle class was very wealthy, the aristocracy and the working people were not. 
comparatively, the inequality was greater. But this didn't happen. This was a problem. And the only place it did happen was in Russia, which was the most economically uh, and politically backward country in all of Europe. It was the only place it happened. And what followed in Russia was 70 years of uh, mass murder and political oppression. But I'm not here to discuss the Soviet Union and what happened there and the spread of communism there. But just to say, that was the legacy. But it never succeeded in the West or anywhere else. Marx, Marxism never took hold. So the political project of Marx, his prophesies, prophecies about this failed. But at that point, the project of cultural Marxism began. And it was a big shift. For Marx, uh, it was all about the money. It was about that's capital. It's about wealth. Culture was irrelevant. He said, in fact, uh, interest in culture, interest in religion, these were bourgeois considerations. They, they don't interest me, and they're of no importance. That's not what the sub substance of the debate is. But for his followers, and the two, two men I'm going to name here, one's an Italian, Antonio Gramsci, the other is a, a, a Hungarian, Georg Lukács, it was precisely in the field of culture that Marx's ideals needed to be fought. And they then did this. And whereas Marx understood class warfare in political and uh, economic terms, Gramsci and Lukács realized that the greatest obstacle to this violent overthrow of the authorities was the structure that supported it. And the structure was rooted in two things that the working class was invested in. One, the family, and two, the Christian religion. The problem for, the, for Gramsci and for Lukács was nobody found these particularly threatening. If they had families, the families weren't an actual threat to them. They didn't want to overthrow their families. Likewise, it's Christianity. They met in churches. They, they, they handed out alms. They, they did good works. They might find them annoying, objectionable, but they're not threatening. Nobody's going to see, uh, purposely go after them for this reason. So what Gramsci and Lukács both did is they uh, in, initiated a, uh, an assault on uh, Christianity and the family, sort of a form of cultural warfare, propaganda. And they, in order to do this, they had to rebrand their opponent. And this, is a, this became a typical strategy of the cultural Marxists. They would vilify their opponents, and then they would totally subvert the uh, agenda there. So in this case, a family is, the, is everyone here comes from a family. Some people come from bad families. That's not what's being disputed. The point here is they were saying every family is oppressive. The family in its very nature is oppressive. Nobody's going to buy that. So what they did in, in propaganda is they gradually represented uh, the, the very things in which they lived and operated, namely their families, and in, in the company of Christians, and they represented it as a coercive force that was above them, that was being imposed upon them. Not as something that they rose up from, like the family, but rather as something that was imposing its values upon them. And so it, it inverted it. It's not something they come up from, it's something that's above them and pushing them down. Now this new revolutionary front is, as I say, cultural warfare. Uh, and they also do something with uh, Marx's initial uh, group of support, which was the working class. That was the initial working uh, support group, was the working class men. They expanded it to include other people. Who are these people? Well, women, uh, criminals, and racial minorities. I mean, it's a sort of an odd connection of people. Like, what do criminals have to do with women? Nothing other than that they are, in some ways, regarded as uh, peripheral and therefore oppressed. But more decisively than this, the cultural uh, Marxists insinuated themselves into the cultural elite. Now, the Mar Marx would never have done this. The, the cultural elite were the bourgeois. They were part of the problem. But for the cultural Marxists, these were the opinion makers, the people they needed to get in league with in order to change the culture. And they did it, generally speaking, to people who wore robes. Uh, academics. I mean, I'm an academic. I'm not wearing a robe. But then academics wore robes. Uh, lawyers in, in the court, we would wear robes. 
uh, judges, actors for the acting profession that would don robes and so forth, and, and even the clergy. So the clergy were one of the, the, the chief means for the culture Marxists to insinuate themselves into the upper echelons of the culture. <clears throat> and it was a highly effective strategy. And the reason that it worked is because the working class people were far too smart to follow for the cultural Marxist uh, nonsense, because they, they're not going to say that the, the real problem is my family, or the real problem is my church. Maybe they don't even go to the church, it's, but it's not, it's not a threat to them. Whereas for the elite, uh, the educators, they were very happy and proud and wealthy enough to swallow the idea that they could be the chief instruments of social justice. They appealed to their pride, and they appealed to their wealth. We can go after the family, and they'll say, okay, go after the family. It's not going to affect me. They can say, we need somebody to implement this new form of social justice, and they can say, well, I'm a good person to do that because I'm in a position of authority, and I, I, I identify with justice. So this is what happened. They believed that they ought to be in charge, and they also welcomed the idea that there was a shift away from the working class towards the marginalized. Very easily for a cultural elite to believe this. And also, I will say one final thing on this. People who were of the cultural elite had no problem with hypocrisy. They had no problem being hypocrites. They could remain wealthy. They could remain privileged. They could signal their virtue. They could sign up for the right causes, i.e. the rights of minorities. And at the same time, uh, they could remain in their own position of power and authority. So they could be allied with this justice movement without actually being oppressed themselves, and they could drive it on. So it's a perfect combination. Now let me talk about how this advanced in a few separate ways. Um, and I'm going to go over this rather briefly and quickly. One of them, uh, I'll connect it around a, a focal point. It's called the Frankfurt School. So in Germany, in the early late 1920s, early 1930s, a school of social philosophy began there called Frankfurt School. Uh, it started there, but it didn't last there very long, because come 1933, the fascists came into power in Germany, and these were socialists uh, of the international socialist variety, not the national socialist variety. And the national socialists wanted them out, and so they, they fled, and they went to America, for the most part. And there they set up uh, sticks in a, very, a variety of places. One of them was in Hollywood. So two of the most prominent cultural Marxists, uh, Theodore Adorno and Max Horkheimer, who's the director of the school, they went to Hollywood, and they got involved in the film and entertainment industry. Um, uh, they also, when they came back after the war, started out uh, some studies, and the study was in the area of prejudice. And the, the most famous of these Frankfurt School uh, authors was uh, Theodore Adorno, and he wrote a book on the authoritarian personality. Uh, almost nobody has read this work now. At the time, it was very popular, but he created something which you probably will at least understand. He created something called an F scale. And the F scale was connected with traditional views of the family and of the nation. And according to your support of the family or the nation, you'd be given a, a number on the F scale. And, and F, that stood for fascist. So if you were a supporter of the traditional family, you regarded family and the life of the family as something that was important, in fact, intrinsic to your life, you were attributed a number on the F scale. And to this day, people who uh, ascribe to Christianity or Christian sexual ethics are labeled as fascists, but this is because of Adorno's uh, authoritarian personality F scale. Again, people have not read it, and yet they use it. You'll hear people called fascists simply by virtue of defending their family and the traditional family. Another aspect, critical theory. Um, the purpose of critical theory is not to think critically. That's what the university has always done. It fosters discernment, debate, and so forth. That's not what critical theory does. Critical theory is an extended, repeated, uh, and implacable assault on its opponents. It's just a negative thing. It never defines what it, what it proposes. It merely attacks what it's against. So critical theory now infiltrates every discipline in the university. 
Uh, and it, it, in some disciplines, uh, with more effectiveness than others, but it attacks everything that, that opposes its criticism as prejudices, and it's going to wipe out all prejudice. Irrespective of whether it's a good prejudice or is a bad prejudice, I think that bullying is, a, is something that ought to be eradicated. Okay. Is that the same thing as a family? Uh, no, I like the family, but I don't like bullying. Yes, but they're both prejudices. So they will attack both as prejudices without discrimination. Uh, arising from critical theory will be, become these new academic disciplines, which are usually identified with the word studies. So there will be, and there are identity group studies. So there's cultural studies, there's women's studies, there are aboriginal studies, there's African American studies, there's LGBT studies, there's post-colonial studies, I could go on. Anything that is studies, these are new disciplines. They're to the university, strictly speaking. I'm talking now of the long view of history. Anything with a study after it. Now, these areas of studies are marked by an identity group. And the identity group is opposed to the commonality that was once understood under the humanities. The humanities is a broad, all-encompassing discipline that will include every individual under that broad umbrella of humanity. These identity group studies deny that that is the case. So they, they reject the common ground. Fourth aspect, domination. As, as I said, Marx argued that history is economically determined. Uh, those who own the means of production have the power, and they determine the course of society. But the Frankfurt School reimagines who the working people are, the proletariat, and they shift the narrative from being great, rooted in labor to uh, uh, the dynamic between the labor on the one hand and the management on the other, and the, the clash between them, to whoever was in the minority group. And anybody who was not in the minority group was ipso facto opposed and oppressing the minority group. So whoever that would be, whoever had social approval was, was exercising a domination over the others and oppressing them by that. And it would be it wouldn't matter what the group would be. Would it be would it be male oppressing female? Would it be black or white oppressing black? Would it be the religious oppressing the irreligious? Would it be the straights oppressing the gay? It doesn't matter. Whoever was socially approved was being considered to be to oppress the others simply by virtue of uh, having social standing. And and so what the cultural Marxists did is they inverted the evaluation there. So the straight, which was formerly considered to be the good, was now the bad. The black, which was considered to be subhuman by racists, would now be considered to be virtuous, etc. Inversion there. I mean, I'm going over this rather quickly here. But those who had been deemed to be criminals before will now be considered to be suffering the injustice of the justice system because there's a structural injustice, etc., etc. Um, and, and now you didn't need to do anything unjust to be labeled uh, somebody who was unjust. You simply had to be in the structure of injustice. So you were a structural oppressor. So if you're a white, heterosexual, male, Christian, whatever, you were a structural oppressor, even if you've done nothing unjust, just by virtue of your identity, that you fit that intersectional uh, uh, category or description. You see where I'm going with this, because it all will sound rather familiar to this. Now this passed through the school system rather neatly, uh, because progressive education had all read, all, always looked to what the future doctrine would be and not what the past was. I'm going to mention one final figure. A uh, man by the name of Herbert Marcuse. Marcuse was, is now almost unknown. But in the 1960s, he was so well known that in the late 60s, uh, in the sexual revolution, uh, the, in, at Berkeley and at Paris and uh, at other universities, they had placards, banners going around, and they said, Marx, Mao, Marcuse. Marcuse alongside the other two identified with communism. And he, as I say, so he was a slogan in, in your university dormitories. Marx, Mao, and Marcuse. Marcuse's chief work was called Eros and Civilization, which is a hybrid of Marxist and Freudian teaching, 
And he makes the case of, by the way, Marcuse is really just a popularizer. He's very good at making his work popular. He doesn't actually come up with new ideas. He popularizes old ones. What are the old ideas? Well, in 1936, there was a man by the name of Wilhelm Reich. He wrote a book called The Sexual Revolution. You ever heard The Sexual Revolution? When does it take place? 1960s. Reich writes it in the 1930s. He's a cultural Marxist. Uh, he also writes something called The Mass Psychology of Fascism in 1933. Both of these men see that the way of the, of the future is through liberation, a liberation of, sexual, of the sexual aspect of human nature, through non-procreative eros. He, he calls it, uh, using Freud's terminology, polymorphous perversity. That's, that's Freud's term. Uh, and what Marcuse does is he brings this directly to family sexual relations. So he destigmatizes every sexual act except the heterosexual act. Heterosexual is considered to be normative, now it was considered to be abnormal. The others were considered to be either abnormal or inappropriate, um, unhelpful, unjust in some ways, well now they were the exact opposite. So now for the, the era of free love begins. So there's now a whole new class of victim group, those who are repressed in their sexuality. And he allies those people along with the racial minorities, the feminists, and create what in politics is called the new left. And it becomes a political movement now. And it becomes such a potent political movement that in the uh, US election, presidential election to the south of our border right now, uh, every Democrat candidate is, a, candidate is accusing the others of being a racist. Every last one of them. Um, which seems to me absurd because I, don't, I suspect that none of them are actually racist. But it's such a potent label now of, of oppression that it motivates the base. Just demonstrating what it says. By the way, it was Marcuse and the Frankfurt School that pathologized Christian morality and deemed it to be the cause of phobias, which is where we get the phrase uh, homophobia from. It first used, I believe, in 1967. A phobia is an irrational fear. It was connected with Christianity by Marcuse and others of his generation. Um, I could go on here, but I, I want to leave some time for my, my friends here, and I'll say one final thing as a, a note of conclusion. The cultural Marxists purport to be on operating on behalf of minorities, and for that reason they have a lot of sympathy from many people. The problem with this is that they oppress the ultimate minority, which is the individual. There is no minority who's less or, or more vulnerable than the individual. Cultural Marxists deny no legitimacy to the individual. Their notion of justice is a movement for identity groups, but it denies justice to individuals, and that's why it gets rid of notions like individual rights of freedom of speech and so forth, and shut down connects debates, etc., etc. I'll just leave it at that, and thank you for your attention.